because I've been working in the area of media and religion for more than 15 years, and it's a very small group of us who um, work in this august group, and I'm so happy to learn about somebody else who is also working in this area. Um, coming out of the last discussion, also what I'm hoping we might touch on at some point, this came out of the end of the last discussion, was this idea of myth-making and amnesia, um, which is all part and parcel of what happens in terms of the media. Um, it really plays into uh, the myths that we create and also I would say something like the 24-hour news cycle certainly uh, changes our idea of what history is and how long history um, exists um, and also the idea of who controls the message and how they control the message uh, but maybe that'll be something that'll come up in our discussion as we move along uh, but anyway I'm very excited to introduce to you uh, Professor Marla Frederick um, also my name was originally going to be Marla um, <laughs> But I became mayor along the way. And I'm just going to um, read from the, uh, from the pamphlet for those of you who don't have it in front of you. Uh, Marla Frederick is a professor of African and African American Studies in the State of Religion at Harvard University. Uh, and she's the chair of the Committee on the Study of Religion. She's the author of Between Sundays, Black Women and Everyday Struggles of Faith, an Ethnography of the Complex Lives and Faith Commitments of Women in Rural North uh, Carolina. She co-authored book, Local Democracy Under Siege, Activism, Public Interests, and Private Politics, which won the 2008 Best Book Award from the Society for the <laughs> Anthropology of North America. Uh, Dr. Frederick's research addresses the intersections of religion, race, gender, media, politics, and economics. A woman after my own heart with that. She is currently uh, completing an ethnography entitled Color, Television, Religion, Media, and Racial Uplift in the Black Atlantic World, and that is what she is going to be talking about today. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Frederick. Thank you so much, Mara, um, for the introduction, and I want to thank Brian Turner for the invitation um, to come speak. Uh, this has really been a great experience for me the whole day, um, starting off with Yosef Soret's um, talk this morning. Um, I, I like to say I knew him when he was a grad student um, <laughs> at Harvard, so we're all very proud of him. And of course, um, Mike Dyson is always uh, inspiration um, uh, th and thought provoker. I, um, my talk today is actually the title um, is um, Colored Television, Black Religion, and Global Context. And I was originally going to talk to you more about my Jamaica work. Um, and then I noticed that the focus really is on black American popular religion. And so I thought it would be important to talk about the history of black um, televangelists um, and their kind of early starts and the kinds of questions that they raise for us around issues of race and class. Um, with that, I'll, I'll begin. And by the way, I have a, a small asthma issue, so don't let my coughing disturb you, okay? I'll be okay. <laughs> the journey to the home of Reverend Frederick Eicher and Cotter in the spring of 2005 was quite simple, an elegant ride along one of Ball Harbor's main roads. Lined with palm trees, dark asphalt streets, white sidewalks, and well-manicured lawns, this section of town was different than its southern counterpart. Both positioned along the Atlantic Ocean, Ball Harbor prides itself on its elegant shops, subtle marquees, and more streamlined store valences. It's where the Jews live, Reverend Ike had told me. Miami, where I stay, just south of Ball Harbor, on the other hand, is loud, bright, and untamed. When the cab finally reached my destination, I looked up to see a magnificent set of high-rise luxury condominiums. Greeted by the especially courteous doorman, I eventually received clearance to make my way through a marble-lined hallway leading to a private penthouse elevator. When the elevator doors opened after a prolonged ascension, I was immediately inside the penthouse apartment of a living legend. Greeted by Reverend Ike's assistant, she immediately showed me around the living room area where the interview would take place. The room's decor held great potential, though falling short of it, as if trapped in a time capsule. Multiple floral patterns were mixed with tropical themes to overburden the space with design. It was an accumulation of years of Reverend Ike's travel and years of memories. 
Nevertheless, all of this was immediately forgiven by the panoramic view of the Atlantic Ocean below. The sun reflected off its surface ever so brightly an hour before noon on a Thursday morning in May. From any room in the house, you could see the massive expanse of the Florida coastline. Reverend Ike had clearly reached the pinnacle of the prosperity he avidly preached. Visiting the home of Reverend Frederick Eichel and Cotter and the former church of Bishop Carlton Pearson reads like a tale of two cities, two lives transformed by the ministry of prosperity and the power of the media. A shadow of its former glory, Bishop Pearson's church, in contrast to Reverend Ike's home, stood ominously along a well-traveled road in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the birthplace of Oral Roberts University and seemingly all things tele-evangelical. Prior to our interview, Bishop Pearson's assistant took me on a tour of their church. The vast building held little more to its inside than reminders of the throngs of people that once flocked the hallways, overcrowded the sanctuary, and filled the bookstore. <coughs> the children's Sunday school classroom displayed drawings seemingly abandoned like many other fixtures around the church. Leaders of the church now barely held on to its title. The numbers of persons on the rolls had dropped by the thousands as members left the church in rejection of their senior pastor's new theology, one that cast aside centuries-old doctrines of the church held sacred by Protestants and Catholics alike. Bishop Pearson was preaching something new. His message was of inclusion, not hellfire and brimstone. Indeed, there was no hell, and any and everybody could and would go to heaven. They were saved, they just didn't know it. Jesus had died once and for all for everybody, period. No need for repentance, no need for confession, no need for a mourner's bench. All were entering and traveling effortlessly along the path once marched straight and narrow. It was now broad and welcoming. This new message had cost him dearly. Time spent with these two luminaries in the field of black religious broadcasting, Reverend Ike and Carlton Pearson, opens up avenues for interpreting the current state of religious broadcasting, as well as the legacy of race in this industry. Reverend Ike had been the leading figure in religious broadcasting among black preachers. Carlton Pearson was in many ways a descendant of his efforts. Pearson held strongly to his Pentecostal upbringing while Ike leaned more heavily into his new thought teachings. The lessons regarding performance, prosperity, and the power of the media are illuminating. Both figures serve, I argue, as quote unquote religious dandies whose quest for upward mobility through the power of faith offer us a roadmap for interpreting contemporary black televangelists. The shifts in performance styles and messages over the years point to changes in the ministry as well as transformations in American society and the power of the media. The spread of prosperity gospels throughout the African diaspora is often linked to, linked to its origins and rise in the United States. Scholars suggest that the doctrines that grew in the United States under the American free market, under American free market capitalism, reached beyond American borders to places like Jamaica, West Africa, and South America in the aftermath of World War II. Given the increased global influence of the U.S., the successful anti-colonialist movements abroad, and the eventual Cold War demise of communism, along with advances in media communications technologies, new opportunities for the rapid spread of American-based religious messages grew. The leadership of this expansion is often attributed to white charismatic figures who not only broadcast their services, but who also physically traveled to various countries in order to hold international revivals. Recent scholarship by ethicist Jonathan Walton, however, points to the seminal efforts of historic black media personalities like, like Red, Reverend Frederick Eicher and Cotter in popularizing this doctrine. This paper opens up a different set of questions by considering the actual performance, performative significance of black religious bodies on television. In it, I argue that these figures were not only selling new ideas about monetary wealth, but also complicated notions of racial uplift as well. In this talk, I, lay, I first lay out my notion of the religious dandy as an analytic tool for interpreting the performative significance of black religious broadcasters against negative modifiers of race and religious provincialism. Next, based upon interviews with Reverend Ike and Carlton Pearson, I argue that the dandy figure stood as an important, though controversial symbol for racial uplift in the 1970s and 80s. Reverend Ike and Bishop 
Pearson were both embodiments of a, a rejected, though resilient, black aesthetic. Reverend Ike's message of prosperity and Pearson's embrace of an unrefined Pentecostalism reflect classic moments in which the medium of television operated as a disciplining mechanism for uncharacteristic black bodies. This work shows how both producers were challenged to rescript for the purposes of mass distribution an acceptable black body. Finally, the work of these early dandies during a, period, a particular racial moment is read against the work of contemporary religious broadcasters like T.D. Jakes and Juanita Bynum. Can they too be measured as avant-garde figures in American religious broadcasting? If we're living in a different historical moment with heterogeneous and successful pictures of black subjectivity already affixed to the public imaginary, i.e. President Barack and First Lady Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, Venus and Serena Williams, Bob Johnson, are those same performances still necessary or have they merely become reflections of the American mainstream? In other words, if we accept on its face Reverend Ike's proposition that his extravagant jest an elaborate aesthetic performance where performances meant to critique white American expectations of black subjectivity and to catalyze a more robust, robust sense of blackness among African Americans, then what purpose do these performances serve today? What role does marketing and the demands of satellite television play in the mainstreaming of these figures? How might these figures redefine a sense of black religious, religiosity? The melting together of voice and video imaging to create television effectively altered the transmission of religious messages. No longer were audiences simply hearing the voice of the preacher on the radio, but they were able to see his appearance on screen, and the picture in, the, in this case was literally worth a thousand words. Early pioneers in religious broadcasting like Rex Humbert, Oral Roberts, and Robert Schuller, leaders of a burgeoning word of faith movement, no longer simply articulated the message of possibility, they could materialize it on stage. Emerging from new thought teachings of the late 19th and early 20th century, their message promised health and wealth to the believer in this life if she or he but demonstrated enough faith. Proponents of this theology like Oral Roberts, Amy Simple McPherson, Catherine Coleman, and T.L. Olson were always a part of, were, were, were always a part of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement. However, denominational Pentecostals became, quote, increasingly critical of the evangelicals' methods, particularly their fundraising and often lavish lifestyles. What was strikingly different among this new group of Pentecostals was the emphasis on this worldly material gains. Classical Pentecostals focused largely on the merits of spiritual riches, often shunning earthly possessions as distractions from the total devotion to God. These Pentecostals typically stood on the outskirts of mainstream American society. Even within the black community, Pentecostalism was associated with those on the economic margins of society and characterized in contrast to Baptist and Methodist traditions as quote unquote low church, given its high emotionalism and often uneducated ministry. The blossoming of the charismatic renewal movement of the 1960s and 70s, combined with the growing influence of charismatic preachers on television reflected the growing influence of Pentecostal expression. Scholars analyzing the growth of Pentecostalism speak both of a growing charismatic movement and a neo-Pentecostal movement, often using the terms interchangeably, focusing loosely on the use of spiritual gifts like glossolalia and faith healings, and a de-emphasis on denomination and a burgeoning theology around self-actualization and prosperity. Steeped in the word of faith movement with its emphasis on monetary wealth, early televangelist performances on the broadcasting stage are reflective in many ways of what Susan Felinier describes as dandyism, an extravagant performance of class status in the face of social marginality. For Felinier, dandies embody, quote, cosmopolitanism, presentation, and spectacle and are engaged in, quote, the passionate pursuit of an, of an original selfhood that makes its own rules. Theoretical ideas such as performance, performativity, dandyism, pastiche, drag, give entree into interpreting the layers of meaning present in televangelists and adherents' attempts to navigate various class boundaries. 
Contemporary theories that rely on notions of performance underscore the tenuousness and fluidity of the subject. Dandyism thus conveys the ways in which historic figures perform class and social mobility through dress, revealing how these personalities are, quote, betwixt and between clearly defined social statuses and, and spaces. The late 20th century version of what I call the religious dandy gained particular momentum given the advancement of electronic media. This dandy is reflected in both black and white male and female televangelists like Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, and Creflo and Taffy Dollar. Tammy Faye Baker, for example, was known throughout the country for her outlandish makeup and eccentric dress. The gender particularities of the religious standard are especially acute given the ways in which women's hair, makeup, hats, shoes, and accessories have been associated with their femininity and, and potential or lack thereof for ministry. Women in religious televangelism, television, for example, have been hyperfeminized in a way that necessarily associates them with a male husband figure. This serves as a particularly interesting contrast to, to the ways in which black women preachers have historically been encouraged to preach and appear as men in order to be perceived as spiritually authoritative and legitimate. The spirit of the Holy Ghost, after all, is a male spirit, as historian Wallace Best reminds us. The dandy's influence expanded not only across gender lines, but also across race lines, hoping, holding particular sway for African-American dandies given the history of race and racism in the US. Black religious dandies coupled their notions of uplift not only to religious narratives, but also to strides against racism in society. Contrary to popular images, blacks could be wealthy in the US and the dandy aimed to show it. As a religious television scholar, Reza Frankel notes, televangelism, televangelists appear at least in the image conveyed by press and television reports as affluent corporate chiefs, wearing custom-made suits, traveling in personal jet planes, and living in comfortable and well-furnished homes. Affluence for these ministries is a sign of success. Often they performed wealth in the face of traditional Pentecostalism's rejection of all outward signs of worldliness. Some scholars have pointed out the excessive dress in the style of religious figures as an analysis of class issues without considering the racial impetus for their dress. The performance of religious dandyism among African American televangelists provided a means of affirming black uplift and social mobility while simultaneously critiquing perceived notions of black religious complacency. In his ardor article, Sartor Africanus, art historian Richard Powell, paraphrasing Amiri Bar Baraka, argues, quote, an analysis of a particular political, economic, and social class of people includes an analysis of their outward as expressive aesthetic selves. For Powell, black dandies included men of the 19th century who were, quote, the occasionally dressed up and highly visible common laborers, domestics, and unskilled workers in the free urban underclass. Often mocked by those who thought their dress was outrageous with its extraordinary, extraordinarily colorful suits and posh shoes, these men demonstrated a level of pride in their posture that flew in the face of critics. The work of the dandy disrupted social expectations. Quote, in a society that sought comfort in clearly defined social roles, in a spatially predictable landscape, despite idealistic claims of a broad-based democracy and upward social mobility, the black dandy's striking, audacious appearance on America's street corners disrupted the white majority's false notions of social order, racial homogeneity, and cultural superiority." End quote. Black dandies insisted on their right to exist in a world that would prefer their invisibility and docility. One can trace the emergence of black religious standees on the, of the 20th century through the course of industrialization and urbanization. Monica Miller builds on Powell's use of the black dandy, stating that, sh that she reads, quote, black dandyism and the politics of its performativity as an index of the formation of this blackness, as a sign of the conceptualization of early Afro-diasporic identity 
as part of a negotiation of the transition from slavery to freedom in America in the 19th and 20th centuries, as an evaluation of the fact of blackness within modernism, and as an Afrocosmopolitan critique of national identity in the late 20th century and early 21st century. The emergence of what Fawcett describes as the black gods of the metropolis in many ways embody what I consider black religious standees. The aesthetic sensibilities of men like Father Divine and Daddy Grace, along with their theologies of economic possibility, crafted a narrative counter to the message of gradualism and survival heard in many black, early 20th century black churches. At the same time, black religious standees have not only disrupted social expectations based on race, they have also disrupted long-standing religious expectations that valorize poverty. These dandies have three major characteristics. First and foremost, the religious dandy insists that his rewards of wealth, excuse me, are gifts from God directly or indirectly. They are not bequeathed from the world or worldly strategies. Often they are described as fin financial gifts to, to described as financial gifts to ministry efforts while they can also include seeds of worship and service. Attributing their wealth to God's bene beneficence or the power of determined faith allows them an unapologetic demeanor in the face of critics who challenge the exorbitant wealth, whether real or merely performed. Second, the religious dandy performs his wealth outwardly, either through verbal testimony or the aesthetics of elaborate dress and expensive lifestyle. According to them, certain elements of success can and should be measured through the accumulation of fine earthly possessions as opposed to waiting for the promised rewards of the afterlife. Third, and equally important, the religious dandy offers a narrative of struggle and redemption. The dandy's wealth does not emerge out of a vacuum, either triumphantly emerging from meager beginnings, a dysfunctional home, or an abusive relationship, the religious dandy is an overcomer. This narrative of victory is central to the dandy's ability to connect with a broader audience. Attempting to undo centuries-long assumptions about the role of black religion and the low status of the black worshiper, religious dandies transform the language of scripture as well as the image of the minister in order to invoke a socially regenerative view of the true child of God. Instead of equating poverty with godliness, religious dandies turned religious language and expectation on its head by asserting that prosperity was associated with godliness. Reworking antiquated theologies taught by slave masters and black ministers alike regarding the intangible rewards of servitude and the immaterial benefits of religious asceticism, religious dandies insisted upon the work of faith manifesting both comfort and material wealth in the present. As with black working class dandies, whose attire often outpaced their income, religious dandies performed wealth as both materialized and in waiting. Name it and claim it theologies, or more pejoratively entitled, fake it till you make it theologies, <laughs> abounded among new advocates of religious prosperity. Reverend Ike is one of the most popular progenitors of this message of prosperity among black ministers, began his ministry as an attempt at rewriting the religious narratives of blacks that held them captive to poverty. According to Iker and Cotter, through his preaching and his dress, his work in ministry was to convince blacks that they too could be prosperous. The mere presence of blacks on television combined with the expressivity of black Pentecostalism created a complicated narrative of black upward mobility to demonstrate at once the presence of fine clothes with the performance of expressive religiosity. Was, has served both to advance the race and to challenge conventional religious <coughs> expressions. Iker and Carter translated his vision of prosperity into reality when he broadcast live from Madison Square Garden on Labor Day, Sunday, September 5th, 1971. With this entree into the world of visual media, Iker and Carter became the first black minister to launch a nationally televised religious broadcast turning his radio message of personal empowerment into a visible image of prosperity for hundreds of thousands in the viewing audience. In contrast to the normative white racial positions of people like Oral Roberts, Kenneth Hagan, and Kenneth Copeland, Reverend Ike's history in religious television offers not simply a narrative of religious engagement, but also a narrative of religious uplift fraught with racial conflict. His presence sparked debate among black religious leaders 
and lay people alike over what it meant to be black, religious, and successful. Coming of age in Richland, South Carolina during the late 30s and early 40s, a period marked by overt racism and spontaneous violence across the country, Reverend Ike experienced firsthand not only the harshness of the South's racial caste system, but also his community's response to the problems of race. While a number of churches were activists in orientation, the reality of Southern life meant that many blacks, like Reverend Ike, grew up in churches that were staunchly opposed to social transformation through civil disobedience and protest. Instead of protest, they encouraged their congregants towards survival. Reverend Ike's earliest memories of faith were nurtured in this type of church, where the preaching moment encouraged poor black folks to make peace with death as opposed to reawakening expectations for life. Baptized at his home church at the age of nine in a creek, quote, unquote, full of snakes, the young Icarin Cotter listened attentively to the preacher whose words he suggests were getting us ready to die and not to live. The sermon would continue on as he saw, quote, people getting happy and shouting over the fact that by and by, after a while, it would all be over for them. For Ike and Rincotter, the preaching as well as the singing both evoked a sense that freedom would come at some point in the hereafter, not during this life. This is a quote from him. I remember one of the old spiritual gospel songs that said, oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. And I think you young people today, he's talking to me, of all races and cultures, need to understand how serious that was, that the ultimate deliverance and freedom for colored people, as they were called, Negroes or Negras, if the Southern white people were trying to be polite. But that final freedom deliverance was death and going to heaven. According to Iker and Cotter, it was the mainstream church's philosophy of survival and freedom through death that changed his thinking about what type of theology he would eventually espouse. By the age of 14, he was preaching, and like numerous other blacks of his generation, by the age of 17, he had left the south of his upbringing and headed to New York in order to t attain a better life. The move to New York proved fruitful for his vision, reinforcing his desire to change how black folks looked at themselves and experienced religion. Quote, black people, Many of the masses of colored people also did not believe that they should be anything, do anything, or have anything. God forbid money. Money was evil. And then this Revanite comes along because you see the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. This Revanite comes along and gets right into people's faces on radio and television and these big meetings and says, no, it's not the love of money that's the root of all evil. It's the lack of money that's the root of all evil. <laughs> I begin my radio broadcast saying, you can be what you want to be, you can do what you want to do, you can have what you want to have, if you believe in the God in you. Ike's retelling of the narrative of his move towards prosperity in the heart of the 1970s reads more like religious revolution than charlatanism. According to Ike, his true purpose was to dramatically alter black people's minds about their human potential in the face of white racism. I'm going to show you this um, clip of Reverend Ike um, during one of these meetings. If you want to experience the very best of life, you must believe that you deserve the best. Too many religious people are taught to believe that they don't deserve anything. And some religious people even pray that prayer. Oh, Lord, I know I'm not worthy. I'm going to ask for some confessions on national television. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer like that? Lord, I know I'm not worthy. Come on, up with those hands. Chicken. <laughs> All right, I have to. I know better now. I know the truth and I'm free. But listen, anything that you don't feel you're worthy of, you can't have. Anything that you feel you do not deserve, that you're not worthy of, you automatically cut yourself off from that good. Listen, you cross yourself up when you pray and ask the presence of God in you for something. And then you say, now, Lord, I know I'm not worthy. You might as well forget it, honey. Right. 
believe that you deserve the best. Now let me give you a bombshell. I want everybody to get quiet. Everybody just walk and sit in the nearest empty seat. Quickly, listen. I want you to hear this. If you ever heard anything, I'm going to tell you something that's only going to take 10 seconds to tell you. But I want you to hear this if you forget everything else I've said. Because what I'm about to tell you will bring you anything good that you desire and it will bring it to you quickly. It will bring it to you in the nowness of consciousness. Listen. Anything that you can actually think and feel that you are worthy of must come to you. Don't clap yet. Hold on. I want to be redundant about this. Please listen. Hang on to every word. Anything that you can honestly think and feel that you deserve must come to you. If any person in this congregation are listening on the radio or looking in on t television, if you can honestly think and feel that you are worthy and deserve a million dollars, that million dollars must come to you. which we call the science of living we say it this way whatever you want in your experience hold it first of all accept it first of all in your consciousness if you could get a million dollar feeling a million dollars would have to come to you if it looked like it was dropping out of the sky it wouldn't actually be coming from outside of you. It would be coming from within your own consciousness. And of course, this is one of the great mystic secrets. Nothing really comes to you from outside of you. Everything comes to you from within your own consciousness. Everything comes to you from within your own inner feeling about yourself. Not according to what others think and feel about you, but your experiences come to you your cursing or your blessing, your good or your evil comes to you out of your own inner consciousness. And once again, let me make the startling statement. If any person could honestly feel and think that he is deserving and worthy of a million dollars, that million dollars would come to him so fast until it would make his head spin. Now, wait a minute. We've had an example in this service. Mother Packnett, who used to be the blind old lady and who was healed. And she was taught by me and many of our services that we deserve the best. This is what I teach the people, that you deserve the best. You deserve the best because you're God's child. You don't have to beg God for anything. The day of begging, praying is over. This is the day of accepting the goodness of God. How many of you believe you can be a millionaire? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you come into your inheritance, so your seed of blessing into my life, right? <laughs> <laughs> Selling prayer cloths, healing oils, and other income generating faith gadgets, Reverend Ike actively peddled his new science of living philosophy to those in the listening audiences. This latter emphasis on mind science, however, exposed Reverend Ike to criticisms that his ministry had become heretical. He had gradually eased out of the fundamentalist teachings of his Pentecostal upbringing and eased into the new, the new thought ideologies of his contemporary mentors of faith. Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking and Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich had become an increasingly significant part of his spiritual diet. These ideologies stressed the power of mind over matter often de decentering the role of, divine, of the divine in human activity. The God in you invoked terminology that placed the individual at the center of agentive action and not God. God wanted 
folks rich and the power to make it happen lay in how they thought about money. When I came out preaching on the radio, Reverend Ike contends, with unremitting bombardment all over the Americas telling people money is good, oh my God, that was heretical. God wants you to have money, oh, that was blasphemy. Yet it was as much his preaching about prosperity as much as his performance of prosperity that invoked consistent criticism. Reverend Ike found himself in a zeitgeist governed by civil rights engagement, not prosperity faith. When his television program, The Joy of Living, finally reached Jackson, Mississippi, Iker and Cotter was informed by the local station that they were getting messages from local black leaders insisting that, quote, we don't want that kind of projection of a black image down here. They effectively had this program removed from the airways. When I asked what type of image they were responding to, Reverend I quickly snapped back, oh, it was this image of a wealthy preacher and obviously well-to-do colored people. For Reverend Ike, it was as much his image of prosperity as much as his message that infuriated blacks and whites alike. Negroes were poor, beat down. This is a different image. That was too much for the black leaders in Mississippi. Male civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy were known for simple, respectable black suits. They could identify with common people who worked hard all week and on Sunday put on their respectable Sunday attire. Their message was one of political freedom and social justice, not monetary increase through individual transformation. While Reverend Ike viewed his own message as one of racial uplift, more often than not, the vision deemed acceptable by black establishment leaders of a religious figure that would uplift the race was not the image of Iker and Cotter. Reverend Ike's type of religious dandyism invoked notions of low-class showmanship and even hucksterism. The overwhelming view of him was that of one exploiting the masses for personal gain. Reverend Ike amassed a fleet of Rolls Royces, Bentleys, oceanfront properties, and designer clothes. The preponderance of his audience never experienced such opulence in their own lives. Even critics overseas made note of Reverend Ike's flamboyant, flamboyance. When a German paper printed a picture of him seated in his Louis XV antique desk um, in his office with the caption, they printed a picture of him seated in this chair um, in his office with a caption that read, the rich nigger in the USA. Mm -hmm. Reverend Ike's response was simple. Of course I didn't object to that as long as they put rich in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> For Ike and Ricotta, the politics of race <clears throat> were not about language and rights as much as money and an abundance of it. As a religious dandy, he stood down objections to his performance of wealth because he believed it was to be an, it was an entitlement from God. Unapologetic until, the, un, un, unapologetic until the end, Reverend Ike defended his work into his later years. The medium of television had given him a secure platform on which to exude his dandyism. Television, of course, is visual, he said, and if you're going to be visual, people might as well have something good to look at. And if you're going to teach prosperity, you might as well look like you are prosperous. <laughs> Although Reverend Ike was the first nationally broadcast African-American televangelist, he would not remain the only one for long. Numerous black ministers drew attention as religious television personalities, including people like Frederick um, Price, Ben Kinslow, um, G.E. Patterson, Creflo Dollar, Eddie Long, T.D. Jakes, all of whom have varying theological commitments and, and understandings of the prosperity gospel. In addition to these figures, the work of much of religious broadcasting in the 1980s was being nurtured in the consciousness of a young black classical Pentecostal named Carlton Pearson. A fourth generation Pentecostal preacher reared in the oldest Pentecostal denomination in the country, the Church of God in Christ, and trained at Oral Roberts University, Pearson learned the ropes of televangelism through his college mentor, Oral Roberts. As a singer in the musical group that traveled with the senior Roberts to revivals and prayer meetings, Pearson was adopted as a son in ministry. Unlike the new thought and science of mind theology associated with Reverend Ike, Pearson's background as a Pentecostal warmed him to Roberts and gave him a different kind of edge when it came to singing in worship services. He had been trained in the spirit-filled, emotive singing, dancing, hand-clapping tradition of the Church of God in Christ. 
fully informed by the free gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, prophecy, and healing, Pearson was able to fit comfortably into the charismatic world of his mentor. With his vocal ability and penchant for engaging preaching, he soon became one of the favorites of Robert's ministry. This expressivity of worship, however, became the tool through which his image was controlled. While some audiences rejected the flamboyant styles of Reverend Ike, it was the emotive Pentecostal expression of Carlton Pearson that had to be regulated in order for him to be well received on television. Pearson's Pentecostalism, colored by the black church expressivity of his youth, had to be tempered in order to remain palatable for both white and black audiences. While certain elements of his free, spirit, free spirited form were celebrated, he had to adjust, adjust much of his performance. This vacillation between the black church in which he was raised and the white, often charismatic audience in front of whom he now ministered reminded Pearson that the Pentecostalism of his youth was not quite ready for prime time. As he advanced in television, eventually becoming one of the first black hosts of Trinity Broadcasting Network, Pearson recalls the early days of working on the show and his struggle to mesh his Pentecostalism with the world of religious broadcasting. Quote, I was trying to get blacks on that network, TVN, years ago. In fact, this is the truth. Every place I went, I was primarily the only black there, and the white churches were happy with that. They didn't want any more blacks, because I fit their mold. You know, I toned some things down. I could get tuned up when they wanted me to. I could shout, I could sing, I could lead the choir, whatever they needed me to do. His willingness to, quote, get tuned up, as well as tone things down, signals the ways in which his Pentecostalism was needed for the viewing audience. Acknowledging his own performative ability, Pearson did not underestimate the workings of race in the media at the time. Considerate of white benefactors, he tempered his style in order to be more palatable. His form of dandyism, imbued no less with a similar penchant towards prosperity, had a heavy Pentecostal edge. With this edge, his performance raised concern over not only displays of wealth, but also articulations of what was presumed to be the exclusive characteristic of black religiosity, emotionalism. As the only African-American on TBN, he tried to include other blacks in the programming. Pearson's annual Azusa Conference, a non-denominational gathering of Christians at ORU, kept him in communication with a steady stream of gifted young black ministers and musicians like Marvin Winans, Donnie McClurkin, Deion Sanders, and T.D. Jakes. These efforts initially met with resistance from station owners because unlike Pearson, other black preachers and musicians would not always operate under standard regulatory patterns. At times, they even fell short of the phenotypic expectations of owners and their audiences. Pearson's caramel-colored complexion, curly hair, and sharp facial features fit the mold of what was acceptable to white audiences. Speaking of his initial introduction of Jake's and others on TBN, he explains, quote, I put them on my national television program because I wanted the world to know there are a lot of charming, anointed, gifted black preachers. And eventually I got them on the show, some of them, but see, they didn't want they thought Jake's clothes were too bright and he was too fat and he was too black and he was too this, even after I put him on the show. But he started pulling the crowds. Paul loved him, Paul Crouch loved him and his message. And the world started getting fascinated with him. Black people were uncomfortable with, uh, you know, us screaming and sweating and hollering. For Pearson, the complications of race were as much about emotional expression as physical appearance. Whites, he intimate, intimates, were at times uncomfortable with the emotional expression of blacks as well as the phenotypic features of some black ministers. Being too black reflected the audience's temperament at the time regarding the presence of blacks whose bloodlines were not properly miscegenated into the white mainstream, Amer into white mainstream America. Not that whites at the time did not often abhor miscegenation, but they preferred its results to pure blood blackness. Whites wanted someone with whom they were comfortable. These audiences, as well as station owners, demonstrated a level of racism of which Pearson believes they were completely unaware. The white man still controls a lot of everything, even in the television world, he says, and they, they're prejudiced and don't know it. They're bigoted and don't know it. They're discriminatory and don't know it. 
While some might question the level of naivete present in discriminatory practices, the results were the same. Blacks could appear on white-dominated religious broadcasting networks as long as they fit a particular mold. Although Pearson understood the racial politics of white media benefactors, he never publicly issued a critique and rarely aired grievances um, privately. For him, this was a part of his calling, to work within the system, gain access, and eventually earn the right to request whom he wanted on air. Quote, my black friends were calling me a Tom, and white folks said that he, um, he said, my, my black friends were calling me Tom, an Uncle Tom. And the white folks said that he, Pearson, was too black um, to be white and too white to be black. He doesn't speak black. So I just, I was careful. I just rolled with the punches, took the insults, like I'm taking today. But I had an agenda. I knew I could not expose my people to that movement and that movement to my people and integrate the churches unless I was quiet and earned the right to gain some influence. And once I did, I could pretty much say, call into California and say, Jan, meaning Jan Crouch, the owner of TBN. I've got Deion Sanders here. He's in the studio, or Emmett Smith's here. I want him on the show tonight. Or I've got somebody that's singing. Do you mind if I bring this person on? You know, that pretty much let me, they pretty much let me call the shots in the end. His peculiar public position kept him in constant tension working to appease not only the white audiences and benefactors who were watching, but making sure that he did not make a mockery or insult black audiences. Increasingly, interesting black audiences, um, he contends, were preoccupied with the style of preaching that was presented to the world. They were uncomfortable, Pearson contends, with us screaming and sweating and hollering. The motif of respectability and concerns about representation have long, these, these um, concerns have long hovered over black church worshipers. Du Bois's articulation of the preacher, the choir, and the frenzy is an ominous reminder of the ways in which black religious life has been both an expression of freedom as well as an Achilles heel for those trying to move more assiduously into the white American mainstream and to those who view such expressivity as disconnected from an engaged intellectualism. Some blacks wanted a minister on television who would present a respectable image to the world. The traditional African-American Pentecostal preacher fell short of this expectation. Pentecostalism, after all, has only recently eased away from its marginalized position within the world of black religious expression. When Pearson visited the home of friends, who were professors at the historically black Howard University in Washington, DC, he was reminded that his image was not merely a representation of his own religious peculiarity, given the limited images of blacks on television at the time, his presence on TBN in the early 1980s said something more profound about African Americans in general. Recalling his conversation with his friends, they told him, when you came on PTL, the Praise the Lord segment of TBN, Everybody would rush around the television to watch you. My children were fascinated with what you were saying. My husband and I were fascinated with how you were saying it. According to Pearson, that one comment communicated to him the prophetic significance of his time on TBN. His later attention to the expressivity of Pentecostalism is what made Pearson both appealing and threatening, that he felt compelled to legitimize a genre that has now gone public speaks to the power of television broadcasting to influence the expressions of religious worship. While other Pentecostals have voiced a similar need to alter the image of Pentecostalism for the airways, the stakes for blacks were even higher. The charge levied against blacks conformed to a larger historical narrative about the innate emotionality of black, believe, black religious believers. Um, historian, what, what Curtis Evans, historian Curtis Evans articulates in his book, um, The Burden of Black Religion as Spiritual Softness, was in effect the combined qualities of emotionality, submission, and humility. It is this element of an emotive and humble spirituality that stood in for the presumed intellectual inferiority of blacks during much of the 19th and 20th centuries. This presumption of an innate emotive spirituality, separate and distinct from an engaged intellectualism, in part certainly informed the concerns blacks expressed regarding how Pearson and other blacks represented them on television. 
as a religious dandy, Carlton Pearson disrupted two assumptions. One, that blacks were poor, and two, that Pentecostal expressivity should remain marginal to the mainstream. Pearson married wealth to Pentecostal expression and placed them both together on stage. The struggle to gain access to the airways and the debate over the proper image of, to present dominated early discussions of blacks and religious broadcasting. While these evangelists wrestled with issues related to emotionalism and extravagant presentations of wealth, contemporary religious broadcasters have made even further concessions to fit into the mainstream and gain respect from their audiences. Eventually, the wedding of Ike's prosperity and Pearson's Pentecostalism took form in the burgeoning neo-Pentecostal movement. Even more cosmopolitan than the work of Ike or Pearson, these neo-Pentecostals often blend a tempered Pentecostalist affect with new thought directives into a seamless theology and presentation of personal power and economic wealth. Their notions of uplift are steeped in the belief that a comfortable middle-class lifestyle is attainable for all, whether in the US, Jamaica, or South Africa. While earlier performances of Wealth by Televangelists featured the bright suits and flamboyant hairstyles of less refined taste, recent images of televangelists tend to fall on the high end of fashion. Such evangelists invest large amounts of money into their wardrobe as well as their bodily appearance. As attire sells, so does physique. Media personalities, even, minist even ministers, reconstitute themselves to appear desirable for the viewing audiences. And you can see this in the stories of people like T.D. Jakes um, and Juanita Bynum, Paula White, Joyce Myers. <coughs> Many of them have undergone um, makeovers, physical <laughs> makeovers, whether it's the loss of weight or facelifts. Um, you can also see this in the titles that people appropriate, whether it's bishop or doctor. And many of the tech, I don't know if you've ever gone to the, gone online, maybe not, I have. Um, uh, there's a website, ficu.edu, um, Friends International Christian University, where people are able to purchase degrees. Um, and that's where they'll have a list of people who've gone through this process, or I should say, go through it. It's an unaccredited um, degree process. Um, by appropriating various class markers, dress, bodily appearance, and social titles, televangelists are able to convey to their audiences a, a type of class status that emanates authority and respect. They are able to transcend the presumed class status of their denominational history. No longer laced by the image of Pentecostalism as a backward and repressive faith, contemporary Pentecostals have appropriated the values of the market as a means of securing their footing in an increasingly global and diverse marketplace. Their positions and presentations of themselves make them attractive American models for emulation that resonate with everyday audiences. I'm gonna um, skip a bit here, but I wanna fill in the space, and the, the space is Carlton Pearson narrates about, in, in our conversation, he began to narrate about um, contemporary uh, televangelists, and he offered his own kind of sense of who they are and the challenges they face, and he, he can, he considers them as almost victims of the system as opposed to kind of progenitors of it. Um, there's a way in which he sees them as held hostage because the expectation is that you'll have a bigger and bigger ministry, you'll have more and more staff, you'll have uh, more, you, you become um, a manager of sorts. He says, now a lot of guys, most of the people that are on television, says they're not paying for it. They're going in the hole every month. It's an expense that they're willing to make because it still advertises their church. It gives them some popularity, it gives them some prestige, and it may give them some invitations to come and preach at conferences. He goes on to say that when I asked him about the motivation for, for ministry, um, given the shadow of business um, and, and, and the, the kind of overarching um, emphasis on business and money. Pearson proposed that it was a complexity of things. I'm going to read his extended comment. He says, first, the person generally feels called almost from childhood. They're humble and they cry and they fast and they seek God and they're nobody and they have nothing and they trust God and they do that for years. And then someday they wake up and they're like, dang, here I am, well done, full adult. 
I've got a ministry with respect. I've got a crowd following me, money coming in, and I've expanded the ministry. I'm on television. I'm on radio. I need a bigger building. I need property. I need television mm. equipment. I need a jet. I need work staff. Mm. So it's like, is the glass half empty or half full? You don't know. You grow, so you need more things to accommodate your growth, to maintain the growth, and to maintain, manage the growth. That's expensive. If you have a jet, the kind of jets that they need, you've got to have two pilots, a pilot and a co-pilot. You've got to pay them 100000 or so a year. <laughs> and you've got to maintain the jet. If one of the engines goes, that's $400,000. Fuel is phenomenal. And you've got to have secretaries. Your secretaries have to have secretaries or administrative <laughs> assistants. You have other pastors, and you have to have a youth pastor or a children's pastor or a visitation pastor, women's work. You hire all of these people, and then they need assistants, and they need administrators, and they need budgets. They have to have their computers and their phone systems and an operating budget. So it goes into the preacher doesn't just fast and pray and seek the face of God. He has to manage. He becomes an employer and an administrator. Mm -hmm. And he generally has to be entrepreneurial to find, to think of ways to make money. So he wears a lot of hats. Plus, he's still a husband, he's still a father, he's still a, or she's still a wife and a mother. He still has all of these responsibilities. Then you've got to be political, work with the denomination that you're working with. So it's stressful. These guys are under a lot of stress. So if they can get on a plane and fly to Maui or Cancun or the south of France, rest a week, they need it or they'll explode. A lot of them have high blood pressure. A lot of them have migraines, have heart trouble. They don't eat right, colon infections and bladder and liver and all kinds of stuff. And sometimes they have a kid that's off or a wife that's depressed or some of them have someone that's caught in some kind of alcoholism or drug addiction. You know, dentists have cavities, and mechanics' cars break down. So no one really expects that of preachers, and no one really suspects. The masses think they've got it going on, but most of these guys are living through hell every day, every day. And a lot of them don't sleep well so much. God is stretching, but the people will stress you. And it's hard to know when you're stretched and when you're stressed. He said, I feel sorry for these guys. Hmm. At one time, racial uplift was respected in the images and expectations of success made popular by religious producers. With religious broadcasters donning tailored suits, expensive cars, and extravagant homes, a novel image of black religiosity was proffered in the US and around the world. <coughs> Set against an historic backdrop of black poverty and social unrest, these images redefine black possibility. Such performances of prosperity uniquely understood as divinely generated and sanctioned formed what I call religious dandyism. This dandyism spoke against prevailing attitudes marking austerity and poverty as signs of God's blessing and instead named prosperity a fundamental right of all believers, even black ones. According to its advocates, prosperity theology proffered for blacks in particular a new vision and sense of ent entitlement to upward mobility. This dandy's adaptation to television broadcasting served to further his power and influence. While some saw the religious dandy's extraordinary flair for the dramatic as an ostentatious mocking of true faith, the religious dandy believed his presentation a divine mandate from God. Critics rendered unto the religious dandy assaults similar to those rendered the smart dressing urban dandy, outrageous, uncritical buffoonery. The religious dandy likewise was rejected by everyday ministers who thought people like Reverend Ike were bad witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Transformed over the years by the swelling demands of the televisual market and conflicts over his expressive Pentecostalism, the contemporary American religious dandy is at times a shadow of his former self. In many ways, this potentially countercultural figure has been altered in order to succeed on white mainstream television broadcasts. One questions whether the term dandy even suits more contemporary models of religious broadcasters. Now fully adjusted, the religious dandy is part and parcel of the American televangelist mainstream. If the black dandy in Richard Powell's assessment was supposed to stand as a countercultural reflection of society expectations, then the contemporary religious broadcaster falls short of standing counter to the culture as black life and black religious life in the states in particular have taken on decidedly more consumerist orientations and the potential for black upward mobility is altered 
The black religious standing no longer falls outside expectations of possibility for the American mainstream, but instead reflects it. That some televangelists at times work against these being perceived as prosperity preacher further speaks to the ways in which religious dandyism of Reverend Ike's day has undergone considerable transformation, whether because of a nightline type exposés about the inner workings of television ministries that have fallen victim to the accoutrements of success and greed or legislative attempts to investigate the spending practices of presumably nonprofit ministries or the simple ongoing critique of everyday parishioners, the discourse on prosperity as equated with purely financial blessing has been tempered greatly. Contemporary religious broadcasters now speak more readily of a type of relative prosperity, one not hinged to financial windfalls, elaborate houses, or expensive cars. Not that they have completely sacrificed these badges of success, and that instead they have added greater nuance to their measure of prosperity. That they speak more of a type of relative prosperity speaks to the ways in which the genre itself is changing, as well as how the people are receiving the message. That, the, that these theologies can be remade and adapted both in their countries of origin as well as in countries in which they enter speaks to the complex nature of globalization and the power of religious broadcasting. Both invite dynamic and uneven transformation, moving almost seamlessly across various terrains, remaking as they go the way the people, that people and communities see themselves, God, and the possibilities for their futures. Reverend Ike and Carlton Pearson are but two of the earliest and most popular black religious television broadcasters whose presence and theological interventions raise questions about race, class, and the possibilities of black social mobility. With the genre growing across the United States, Latin America, West Africa, Europe, and even Eastern Europe, Reverend Ike and Carlton Pearson are far from the last. Thank you. You'll have to excuse me because I think I lost feeling in my hands about 30 minutes ago. So, um, thank you very much. That was really terrific. Um, and it brought to mind a couple of things um, for me. One, that uh, there hasn't been a, a whole lot of discussion historically about televangelists. There's been some studies of televangelism, but just very, very, very well-known ones. And um, I would uh, mention to you, Heather Hendershot has a new book called What's Fair on the Air, where she also looks at historically some, some lesser known. Um, but this is certainly the first time that I'm hearing about um, African-American um, televangelists and from, a, from a historical context, and, and it's very, very interesting. Um, also, I have to say, I may not think I'm entitled to a million dollars, but I want the pink suit and the ruffled shirt, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to talk about in terms of putting this into perspective for people who may or may not know about this, in terms of televangelism, um, broadcasters were required to, in the United States, to allow television, allow religion on the air. Uh, but in order to figure out who was going to have access to the broadcast airwaves, um, it went to the mainstream Protestant denominations. And so anybody else who wanted to be able to get on the air, they were the ones who became the televangelists. They were the ones who had to raise money. And so within that framework, it becomes a situation where you have to become a performer, right? That you have to create some kind of a performance that people are willing to pay for. And so that's going to look very different from a, a traditional religious presentation, which is what, what most of the broadcasters put on the air. I have a couple questions for you too um, before I get to the end. But there is that need to perform, and the, the prosperity gospel therefore then fits into that mold. If I'm going to get on the air and say to someone, you're going to howl and, and, you know, and you're going to be damned for the rest of your life, it's real easy for somebody to get up and turn the channel. But if I tell you that you're going to be rich and that, that if you watch me and, and if you do what I do, and I'm showing that to you within the context of this media form, you can see that this is something that is is um, achievable. What was really interesting to me too, and, and I think it's often hard for us to imagine at this particular point in time, 
how big a deal it was to see a black face on television. Um, I'm 52 years old, and I remember the days when there were three broadcast networks, and those were the, that, right? Okay. Um, and you saw, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Bill Cosby um, and Julia. I remember, you remember the TV show yeah. Julia, which was, a, was a, an African-American woman who, had, uh, uh, who was a nurse. And that was it. That was really it. And maybe um, a black entertainer here or there on a, on a variety show. Yeah, or Star and Star Trek. <laughs> and Star Trek. Oh, yeah, and that can call on, on whatever variety show. And, and that was really it. So, so try to imagine, right, seeing, seeing a televangelist, seeing someone in this um, area uh, of authority, you know, really turns that on its, on its head a bit. Um, I love this idea of religious dandies. Um, I just think that, that that's so interesting because not only are you seeing uh, black faces on television, but black faces in in, in an area of authority and an area of wealth. Um, I also was thinking about this idea, uh, which not new, but, but something to, to, to think about here too, is this idea of the prosperity gospel within the context of the American dream. Right, and that that this is something that we we all sort of um, aspire to, um, and this idea that you know that the middle class lifestyle is attainable by all that is, you know, that's who television is set up for. Television is set up for the middle class and the upper middle class. Those are who advertisers and marketers are most trying to target, and so to to create a television model within which that fits makes a whole lot of sense. Um, two questions, actually three questions I guess I have for you. Um, one is, what, what time period are you talking about in terms of, you were saying the 80s um, in terms of Pearson, but I wasn't sure exactly the time period that you were talking about um, in terms of Reverend Ike. Um, 70s. 70s, okay. And, um, and where specifically were they distributed? Because in terms, in terms of television, because most televangelism is presented um, in individual markets around the country and not on a broadcast network, so it's not nationally distributed, but in individual markets. And I was um, interested in knowing where exactly, if you, if you do know, is if, it, if he stayed sort of out of the, out of the southern states. Um, and also, just thinking in terms of Trinity Broadcasting. Trinity Broadcasting in and of itself is sort of a ghetto. Um, it's, it's very specialized to a very particular kind of an audience that is going to, uh, that, that kind of very religious, very conservative broadcasting is going to appeal to. So um, sort of layer the race aspect on appealing to a very conservative religious group, I think is also um, something I, I would just love to hear your comments. On, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Yeah, so um, when I um, interviewed uh, Reverend I, he, 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 he talked about being the first nationally broadcast. He didn't name like where mm -hmm. he was a broadcast, but certainly outside of New York property and certainly in the South, mm -hmm. in different parts of the South, um, just because people knew him there mm -hmm. um, and had access to his, his television show. And with TBN, TBN is, I hear you when you say that it's a kind of ghetto, if you will, of religious broadcasting in some ways, in the sense that it's the... the but it's also the biggest, on, right? Yeah. Right. Mm. It's, it's the largest, not only in the U.S., but it's, it's international. It's the largest international broadcaster. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about people who watch religious broadcasting, as you well know, these are mm -hmm. people who are already kind of committed to faith, as the studies have shown. They're not people who are necessarily seeking. So people like Joyce Meyer mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and to some extent Jake's um, have attempted to buy airtime on stations outside of the religious broadcasting network so they can escape this kind of narrow mm -hmm pigeonholing of their messages to the specific um, communities of faith. 
At the same time, because TBN is so international, it reaches a much broader audience mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. American right. Christians. Right. Um, and so when I was in Jamaica, you know, Jamaica is, one could say, arguably the most religious country in the world. It has the most churches per square mile than any other country in the world. And they, everybody there knows Jake's and mm -hmm. Juanita Bynum, and mm -hmm. it's a it's a casual it's a it's a common conversation. Um, and when you're in Jamaica, there's a competition between say TBN as a cable broadcast network and Mercy and Truth Ministries and Love TV, which are locally owned. Lo yeah. Love TV is locally owned. Mer Mercy and Truth is a cable broadcasting company. Um, but the competition that exists is is striking. Mm -hmm. um, let alone, nevertheless, people still watch TBN primarily when they're looking for religious broadcasting, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. people who are inside of the church and people who are right. not inside the church. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Open it up for discussion. If you can come up to the mic, so. Uh, during the course of your talk, I was reminded uh, repeatedly uh, by things that you mentioned of um, Thad Russell's book called The, the Renegade History of, of the United States, which is the first book I ever read that kind of doesn't dismiss prosperity gospel, but on the, on the reverse, actually, without qualification, celebrates them as kind of being uh, uh, representatives of prosperity gospel of being... Um, being part of the renegade history in, in, in the U.S., which is kind of uh, this idea that there's there's a str uh, against the renunciative ethos of American citizenship, American democracy, there are these groups throughout throughout American history that um, kind of embody a politics of pleasure that uh, doesn't doesn't buckle under uh, the demands of citizenship and engaging in civic institutions and so on. Um, and I was wondering how you how, how these two dandies that you've described to us, you know, whether, whether you think seeing them in this kind of a history would make sense, um, whether, um, you know, would you, would you go there, uh, or do you think that's, you know, too, too problematic? Seeing them in what, what kind of history? Say that again. Uh, a history that, that, you know, would celebrate this as, as kind of a subversion of uh, of what otherwise is this very renunciative notion of, of American citizenship. <laughs> I, I could see it as um, a stretch in some regards. Um, at the same time, I, I don't completely disavow Reverend Ike's kind of commitment to the idea that he's trying to create or try to present a, a different idea of black subjectivity that people weren't accustomed to seeing, right? I, there's a part of me that, that, that buys that, right? And, and, and not only because this is 1970s, but because when I go to Jamaica and I talk to people there who love T.D. Jakes or who love Juanita Bynum, it's because they see themselves in these people and they see, them, they see possibility. So beyond even kind of a race class dynamic, women are identifying with people like Juanita Bynum, they're identifying with people like Joyce Myers, whether it's because of their narratives of sexual trauma or sexual kind of indulgence um, and redemption, they see themselves in these women and articulate a different narrative for their futures as a result. So I do see that the kind of possibility that comes from religious broadcasting. <laughs> this is interesting to me. Um, <laughs> The dandy part, I uh, that re, re, religious dandy, is that, is that religious say? dandy. Yeah, that re, replaces uh, religious pimp in the po popular jargon. I yes, guess. Yes, please, so. please, <laughs> please, please, please. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, but I, um, I, yeah, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I wonder, <clears throat> Carl. I, I spent some time with uh, Carlton Pearson mm -hmm. and. Uh, and you interviewed him, when was this? This was 2005, 2006. Yeah, because I think he, I he'd have started. a little bit, he, he, his narrative would be a little different now, I, you know, at, at this point after all he's gone, gone through. But I, oh, go ahead. 
But, well, I mean, in the sense that I think that he, his description of how of the trauma of what ministers go through and how they're, it's almost like they're, they're pushed, you know, to, uh, to these extremes. I think what's left out of the equation is that many of them, um, it is their goal uh, right. to, 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 uh, to, to, uh, to be rich and to be powerful and to run, uh, to run empires. Um, and in terms of the images, for instance, um, uh, Juanita Bynum, um, some of what is, is taught is just so outrageous um, that uh, I, I think that that has <laughs> some of the excesses, not just of their sortorial ex expression, <laughs> aesthetic expression, as we talked about, the excesses of their, of their messages and their distortions, and almost like a willful uh, performative distortion uh, in order to, to, to serve their, uh, their need for uh, 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 status ascension or, or, or status uh, maintenance. And um, so what am I saying? I guess what I'm saying is that you I think that so much, it is so performance driven, uh, so much is televangelism and it is, uh, uh, it is, what's the word I'm reaching for? There is so much, there's such a self-serving nature to it uh, that I think that in, in all of our, um, I'm trying to be nice, but, but in, in terms of all, 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 all of our. Uh, You're like, how could you be so gracious to these people? Right. And, you know, and, right. But you know, in, in the way that we understand them, I think this, I, I like like I like get your thoughts on it. That it's important to always uh, to, to always factor these factors these factors in because what what is being pervaded to a large extent is is a real not only distortion of the faith that they claim to hold hold dear. Not only do they uh, do they uh, are, are they um, wasting resources of all kinds of of, of poor people um, who, and uh, who are. Uh, who are being so swayed and caught up in emotionalism and, and looking at the you know the the by and by that they don't get in that they don't that they don't feel they have to do anything today like like uh, they become uh, apolitical like like Reverend I so I'm saying this is like there, there's some real culpability in, involved here and I'm just right, right. so you know I'm you know where I'm going so I you got me coughing no I am I completely hear you now I skipped a couple of pages in there before I got to Carlton Pearson's long quote. And so I think you would have appreciated those pages, so maybe I should have, should have actually included them, because he did talk kind of extensively about the egoism that goes into building these empires, that people really want to be known, that they want their name out there, they want the celebrity, they want the big business. Um, <coughs> the, reason I, <coughs> the reason I pointed to, in the last part, that very long statement of his about what happens to the ministries is because as a part of the larger book project, what I want to point out is that there are three groups of people, I would argue, who are involved in this process. Producers, who are like the televangelists, consumers, the people who watch it, and the distributors. And they feed one another. And there's this, the market, the, the kind of force and power of the market drives a lot of that, a lot of the energy around prosperity gospels. For example, <laughs> when I interviewed, I interviewed Tony Evans and um, one of his assistants. Oh. I interviewed Tony Evans and one of his assistants, and his assistant said, you know, we started out on, in television ministry, but we realized that in order to stay in television, we would have to become prosperity preachers that we would have to start selling the gospel in such an aggressive way in order to afford the airtime that we were paying for. And so we pulled out of it. So I, wanted, I talk about them as a part of like a cog in a wheel in a system that is driven by kind of strong market forces. And so I, I don't want to make it sound too much like they're heroes, but I did want to give voice to the kind of um, to what they would imagine at one point in time, some, at least Reverend Ike's kind of reimagining of his own history and even Carlton Pearson, 
the kind of work that they were trying to do for black Americans as far as re, re, kind of reimagining their own subjectivity. Um, but at the same time, they get caught in this process. And not to say that they are pure victims, because clearly, if you're driving a Bentley, <laughs> you've got a panoramic <laughs> view of the Atlantic Ocean, you're not doing too bad. Um, but at the same time, there is this, this other thing that, that's going on that, that motivates um, much of what we see. I um, talked to, in the process of thinking about the, the distributors of televan television, I interviewed people at TBN and at INSP and some of these other places, and it was just very clear to me that many of the people who are on air struggle to pay their bills. Um, and when I interviewed one of the women who manages finances for ministries, uh, she talked extensively. She said, if it costs 15000 to be on our airtime for, for 30 minutes, it costs 20 or 25 to be on TVNs, and that's 30 minutes, right? So as I say, it's $20,000 for 30 minutes of airtime. If you're on four times a month, that's $80,000. If you're on more than one station, that's that much more money. So there is this, this other thing that's going on behind the scenes that drives a lot of this heavy emphasis on money and prosperity. May I, may I just mm -hmm. well, um, one thing I want to say, I think it's what you're doing is, is important. I mean, you're giving voice. You're giving voice to this, and it's, the voice is not really heard, you know. Uh, uh, so it's giving some balance, you know. Um, but I guess the question I would, a I would ask is, um, and this is a, I mean, I have my own, my own thoughts about it, but I'm wondering, the question is, the prior question is, why do they feel the need to be on TV anyway? I mean, why do so many of them, it's like a rite of passage or something, uh, well, it has become that. But early on, why did they feel the need, do you feel that they were really, there was a, a noble cause, they really wanted to, you know, do evangelizing, or was it, uh, uh, or uh, was it, you know, ego self-promotion, or was it equal parts? I mean, you know, in its early stages, that's a real question. So, <laughs> it's, yes, please. Make it long so she can call. Okay. No, I just want to piggyback <laughs> on your point, yeah? To also talk a little bit about some of the members of those congregations and the competitiveness they feel amongst themselves and other congregations. For instance, just talking about the Atlanta um, scenario, where the members of TD, I mean, Eddie Long's church felt in direct competition with the members of Creflo Dollar's church. And so if Creflo was on TV to show that Eddie had even more anointing than Creflo, Eddie needed to be on TV. And if Creflo <laughs> got a jet, well, we know our bishop is more anointed and more, you know, touched by God and blessed by God than Creflo, so we need to have that. So maybe you can nuance your answer a little bit to reflect also the feeling of, not all, I don't want to make it seem like everyone sitting in the pews is, is competitive or duped as you were trying to make it seem like they were apolitical, um, <laughs> but just nuance it a little bit about what's going on in the pews as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to, to um, speak about people's motivations, right? You can talk about what happens yeah. But it's hard to talk about I mean, what motivate, right? <laughs> like, really go ahead and say it. Um, so, so if you read Shane Lee's work on T.D. Jakes, um, Shane says in his book pretty much that that T.D. Jakes orchestrated his rise to success, that he pushed open doors so that he could get an, an entree into the world of televangelism. That presumes a lot upon T.D. Jakes. It could be true, it could not be true, I don't know, right? So it, it, it requires almost being in the mind of someone about their motivations, right? Um, Reverend Knight, I mean, I'm thinking of the early, the early years of my question, the early. Right, it's, it's also about how people remember history. It goes back to the issue of amnesia, right? You selectively forget what you want to forget and remember what you want to remember. Reverend Ike wants to be remembered as a part of this long narrative of 
black social uplift in the 60s and 70s, and he's ar orchestrated and articulated his part of that, right? And so he says, I was right. I was talking about prosperity. If you look now, the AME Church, he pointed to a magazine where the AME Church was having a conference on prosperity. He was like, see, the AME, they shunned me back then, but look at them now. They're talking about prosperity when I was talking, you know, and I was the first one to talk about it. So there's a way in which he wants to remember himself as having been a part of this whole push towards black uplift. Um, uh, but but to, um, to Adrian's comment too about um, the congregations, I think that's so true. I don't know that pastors respond to that energy, but one certainly knows that congregants compete amongst themselves about whose pastor has the most anointing um, and whose pastor is most successful. And even when I interviewed the woman, um, <coughs> one, of the, one of these television networks, she says, you know, she'll have people calling in saying, my pastor is going to be the next T.D. Jakes. My pastor is, you know, we, he needs to be on TV. And she's, she says, but who is your pastor and what is his ministry? And so she, she goes through her own process. But she says she, see, she hears it all the time, the kind of competitive edge that comes with, with broadcasting. Um, this might sound a bit negative, but it's really just a, a kind of academic question. Um, I've been trying to do some research on resentment and mm. what I call greed talk um, and looking at the conditions under which people feel resentment and when resentment spills over into rage. And we did a bit of sort of historical research on trying to map greed criticism and the up and down of the business cycle and it seems to fit very well as what, commonsensically you might just think mm. when things get bad people are resentful and they start criticising, you know, um, the system or whatever. And I think the occupation of Wall Street is a very good example of what I'd s regard as a kind of resent resentment outpouring against the system. I say, what's the interface between the gospel of prosperity and the business cycle? And, and if the American dream has come to an end, um, where's, the business, where's the prosperity gospel going to go next? Now, that's a kind of speculative question, but we could ask ourselves, what happened during the Depression? Was there lots of prosperity talk in the Depression? I mean, it's not surprising that prosperity gospel is really flourishing in the 1970s when the American dream is booming, the consumer revolution is in place. Um, while I've got the mic, can I ask some other questions or make some comments on today's talk? Um, nobody yet has mentioned Roman Catholicism, and I'm kind of interested in what's the relationship between popular culture and Roman Catholicism, and that may be directed more at some of the other um, papers we've had, but I, I, I spent five years in Singapore, I spent a lot of time in the Philippines, and it's quite interesting to look at the charismatic movement within the Roman Catholic Church, which has its own prosperity gospel. I did a bit of research on El Shaddai, which is this, um, I don't know, working class uh, prosperity gospel that's very popular amongst Filipino domestics in places like um, Singapore. So I'm interested, it, I mean, one can understand why preaching in the Protestant church has fitted this model <laughs> of prosperity gospel very well. My third question is, where does, Libera <laughs> where does Liberace fit into this? I mean, it's interesting, <laughs> it's interesting to think about white um, dandyism, it, and I don't know quite historically where that might fit in. Finally, could someone talk about Oprah Winfrey? Because she's a kind of... Um, the, you know, the feminine, modern uh, di uh, dandyism. And I've got two cough sweets, if you would like. Yes, cough thank sweets. you. <laughs> I'll need them to answer this. If you can get into those, I might help. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, great questions. Um, on this economic downturn, what happens to the prosperity gospel? Great question. Um, I don't think it goes anywhere. Um, people are still <laughs> preaching um, prosperity and actually just making it fit into the narrative of prosperity, right? With this, with this um, weeping indoors for a night, joy comes in the morning, right? This is a momentary setback. When I was in um, South Africa, I went to T.D. Jakes' Megafest International when he had the big um, event there in 2008. And this was in the middle of the downturn. I mean, this was at the very, you know, epicenter of the downturn in October 2008. 
And so you turn on the television and CNN, it's all, all versions of CNN worldwide, and everybody's reporting back what's happening in, all across Europe, what's happening in the US, all of these markets crashing. And so we go to the meeting, and Paula White is preaching to throngs of black South Africans. And she's on the stage, and she talks about this economic downturn and what everybody's talking about. And she says, but I want you to know that this is just a setback for a setup for a comeback, right? Yeah. And she says, <laughs> she says, she says, no, she says, you know, this, everybody's talking about money being lost and money gone. She says, this is a shifting in the atmosphere. God is transferring the wealth of the wicked for, to the righteous, right? And, and, and there was a moment where she said, you know, you got to spin around, right? So you got to spin around and believe, you know, confess and spin around and believe and manifest it, right? So there's a way in which the economic downturn simply is plugged in as a part of the formula for prosperity, even as we wait for it. That's the promise of prosperity, right? You walk in it even as you wait for it. Um, and so it, your, your, your comment about resentment brought to mind um, an article by uh, Daniel Jordan Smith. It's one of my favorite articles. It's about Nigeria and the prosperity gospel there. And he argues that because the prosperity gospel didn't fit neat, neatly into um, the, the social practices where people who have are supposed to share the communal nature of the society, when prosperity gospel preachers became really wealthy, it was presumed that it was a part of the occult. And so people began to burn down these prosperity churches um, and organizations because the people who were becoming wealthy were simply buying bigger cars, bigger houses, um, nicer clothes, but the people around them were still poor. And so they weren't transferring their wealth to their neighbor, and as a result, people felt that it was a part of the occult. So this is a really interesting read on how prosperity gospels can fit or cannot fit into the kind of social fabric of, of a society. Can I take the Catholic, let me just take two mm -hmm. seconds on the Catholic question. I'll take a, a, a hit on this. Um, part of the issue with, with Catholicism, because particularly my work in terms of marketing, they, they don't get involved in it. And, and a lot of it has to do with that there's not a tremendous amount of flexibility around the work. Right when it comes to Protestantism, you you can play with there's a little fungibility in the text, right, and and how you play with it, and that doesn't exist in in Catholicism. But what's interesting is, um, I just found something that they have called uh, ucat.org, and it's uh, the Youth Catechism, and that's actually uh, it's something online where youth can come in and start to put their own meanings against the. Catholic Catechism. So that's one place that I've seen it, but, but in terms of television, you, you don't tend to do it because there isn't the ability to be able to, to play around with it to drive, to drive a market. I, that would be my guess. Thank you, Marla. Always a pleasure to be in the same room and hear your presentation. I guess my question um, is about race and class in mm -hmm. this conversation and often um, and I don't know the literature that well on this, so this is really um, kind of general question. Um, and the expectations. So even the, the, the folks that we're talking about in terms of black religious broadcasters, but then also women like Paula White and Joyce Meyer, even if they've arrived in these status of wealth, they still hold on to or present a kind of working class identity, mm -hmm. essential to, right? So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering why the criticism, is the criticisms why are the criticisms rendered on these folk, in, uh, as whether as pimps or as what have you, or it, I guess I shouldn't say why, is it different when someone like Reverend Ike is in New York City at the same time as Norman Vincent Peale at Marble Collegiate, right? I don't recall, I don't know the history or the historic for that well, but it doesn't seem like the same questions are raised of that affluent congregation talking about a politi power of positive thinking, right? Um, or of Reverend Ike at the same time, right? I mean, not Reverend, um, Father Divine even earlier, right? So, or Robert Shute, right? So there's a kind of class discourse that 
It's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. I don't. So I don't. I'm. That's a confused question. Ramble to think <laughs> how, how race and class is here. Because you're asking why why these black ministers receive such strong critique as opposed to the white ministers who do the same. Is that or do asking? they? Right. I mean, it's it like it just kind of as an observation, as, as an observer who this isn't necessarily like the primary area of my study. It seems to be right. So Curtis Evans argument around the burden of black religion. Well, I, is, yeah. Is that, no, yes yeah, no, no, no. Well, I think. I, mm. <laughs> I'm thinking that maybe it's because. Mm. You'd have to think about the percentages. So so I wonder how many black people watch and consume the messages of a Jake's vis-a-vis -vis white people consuming the message of uh, Robert Schuller, right? And if there's a way in which all black religion then becomes categorized around this notion of black popular religion, which goes back to your comment earlier, Adrian's comment earlier, your dialogue, um, about how black popular black religion becomes popular in a way that white religion doesn't necessarily become popular, and as a result, you're able to critique black religion in in a way in a, in a, in a stronger kind of more visceral way than you would a Norman Vincent Peale or Robert Schuller. I just um, and I, I guess if I add to I think in terms of your question about uplift and racial ideology. Oh, absolutely. Right, the same way with the new Negroes, right, the, absolutely. Uh, uh, uplifting in particular ways, right? Right. Like Dr. Right. King uplifted. Right. Dr. King uplifted, not Father Divine uplifted, right? <laughs> there's, there's, right. There's, a, a, there's room for more nuance as one studies and thinks about white religion than there is room for nuance as one studies and thinks about black religion. And that, I guess, I was, that's why. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, Hi. Um, I was very interested, I'm very interested in, in the way uh, popular religions make bridges between uh, religion, entertainment, economics, and politics. And I was, I was very impressed by the f one of the first statements that the, the preacher said on TV. He said, he quoted this, this um, uh, Bible statement, I'm not worthy of it. And so he was completely going uh, counter, right, countering it. And this is a revolution because this is like a central thing in, in Christianity, right? It's right before the communion. So I was amazed that it worked, that it was accepted, and it, that it actually became popular. And uh, popular maybe in two senses, in the sense of, you know, television uh, reaches a, a lot of people at the same time, so like the masses, and popular in, sen in the sense of entertaining, right? And, and, and that it would have success and that people would like it. And I was trying to think of my, my references, the references I have. Um, I've been studying, I'm studying Judaism, and I've been studying a, a Buddhist group called the, so the Sokagakai. And, uh, and I'm thinking of uh, Berg's Kabbalah, the Kabbalah Center. So these are two um, different types of um, theology of uh, prosperity, pros uh, yeah. And, uh, but they have not become popular. So they may be popular in the sense that the Sukhagakai is the only Buddhist group in the West that is attracting uh, more lower class people. So in that sense it's popular, but it's not popular because it's considered a cult. And the, and the Kabbalah, uh, Berg's, Berg's um, Center for Kabbalah, may, may be considered popular because of Madonna and Britney Spears and popular in that sense, but it's not popular in the sense that it's very much criticized too. So it's, I mean, I, it makes me reflect and come back to the definition of what, what, makes, what makes a popular religion, what makes this work? Why does it work for this kind of you know, pr Protestantism? And why doesn't it, doesn't it work for you know, the, these two groups, if you have any? Uh, comments on that. Thanks. Um, I think I, I, I caught the, the latter half of your question. I did want to comment on um, what you said about Reverend <coughs> Ike kind of turning on its head this notion that you're not worthy, right? Because what, what prosperity gospel does is it takes kind of traditional teachings and turns them on their heads so that 
there's a new way of thinking about something that may have kind of canonical history. For example, when prosperity gospels um, came to rise, and, 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 and when people talk about the heresy, if you will, of prosperity gospels, it's because of this very thing that they turn on its head kind of taken for granted kind of historical understandings of Christianity. And one of the crown jewels of Christianity is the narrative of Jesus being poor, right? And his mother no, having nowhere to lay her head when she's given birth, right? Um, and yet in Prosperity Gospel, there is a whole new narrative that Jesus actually wasn't poor, that Jesus was wealthy, that the frankincense and myrrh that the wise men brought was so valuable that it transcended and gave him a status above that of others. So there's a way in which the whole story that's kind of taken for granted Christianity is something very new and different and it legitimizes one's pursuit of wealth, right? Because you can now say, well, all the people that believe that are just wrong and we actually have the truth of what the scriptures are trying to teach. And so it kind of builds momentum because people can then see still in scriptures. They don't have to throw out the scriptures, right? They just have to read the scriptures anew. And that is what gives validity to the, to the argument. Um, just to kind of add to your the theological discussion you were having about the reinterpreting of the kind of figure of Christ as poor or not, you know, frankincense, I guess, if, you know, you can adjust for inflation was a lot of money, maybe a million dollars or something. But uh, the question I had is related because I think there's a lot of theological creativity, right? Absolutely. But is there also liturgical creativity? And the question I have is what does media do to religion, not what does religion do to media? That is in the sense as you were saying, you're buying TV time in 30-minute blocks. Mm. I mean, I've been to church a long time, and not many things take 30 minutes, you know what I mean? Right. So I'm wondering what kind of things are, you know, left on the editing room floor? You know, right. what's taken out liturgically? Are there kind of then theological consequences to that in terms of, I guess in, in terms of the tradition of Pentecostalism, there isn't a dominant, well, there is, I guess, Assemblies of God. There is a ecclesiological kind of structure, but you can play a little, but I'm wondering still, is there a kind of like uh, liturgical creativity alongside the theological creativity in the kind of gr uh, groups that you're looking at? Oh, that's a great question. Um, um, you know, uh, as I interviewed, <laughs> one minister who's um, on television, he talked about the packaging for this 30 minute block. And he says, I preached the sermon, I know I have our, our um, media consulting, our marketing consultant. They take the message, they take the church service, and he says, and they edit and splice it up in a way that I don't wanna see it anymore. He says, I don't wanna see what they do because they're doing something different with the message than what I did in, in service. This is an I don't wanna see it, right? It was just an interesting commentary, right? Because he's saying, I, st I know that I still need to pay these bills, and so what the final product is, I'm, I'm not interested in actually seeing that because it's something different than what happened in service, which is, you know, it's quite a sad commentary in my opinion, right? So they, they butcher, edit up your, your, your service for this, for this moment. Um, but you know, it, 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 it's also interesting in talking to um, the people behind the cameras, right? So I interview people who work behind the cameras and they say, well, you know, we always try to zoom in and get, a, get good shots, whether it's you know, somebody's tear coming down or whether somebody's shouting and moving because we need people to understand that this is an exciting service and it's something that they need to tune into, right? So anything that may seem kind of almost quiet and meditative or something, something non-engaging is not really what's gonna try to be the first thing that's, that's, that's gonna um, make, you know, make, make the show. Um, so there is a lot of editing and artwork, if you will, involved in the creation of this 30 minute block or 20 minute block that we actually get to see the rest of it is commercials. So. 
Oh, Bray. Just an addendum to what I said earlier. This is really fascinating. I'm going to tell you, it's really fascinating. And, uh, you know, one of the ironies is that um, when you look at new thought religion, for instance, um, it, and, and this uh, prosperity gospel, new thought is built on something like, uh, like we are co-creators with God. We, you know, we, we can co-create our, our, our reality. And so you have all the, you know, these new thought folk who aren't necessarily Christians, you know, but, um, um, and it's, you know, envisioning your realities, much like the prosperity preachers do. But there is like a sort of an, uh, an internal uh, component to it that involves some meditation, some envisioning, you know, some quiet, um, which and the irony of it is that, that they're on to something with the prosperity, prosperity preachers. I mean, they're based on a, on a the, the basic foundational principle is not, you know, not a bad one that, you know, we can help create our own reality. Um, but the, the form, for instance, the format does not allow them to do the kind of work, you know, there's, there's no tradition of interior, interiority, um, you know, with this. So that's, that's sort of, um, so that there's an irony there. You see what I'm saying? That, that there's something there, but they can't really follow it through because of the form and also because of the performative a aspect. It just will not hold enough people's attention. Um, like, you know, Eric Butterworth on the other side, you know, would, would not have had a big, uh, you know, would not have had a big, big audience. And then I guess the, the last thing that, that you bring up is that, um, respond to your last um, statement, um, that it's not just that they turn uh, turn the gospel on its head or turn the Bible on its head. It's that they um, they distort historical reality, you know. Mm. And they don't have to do that in order to make their, you know, to make their their points. They don't have to take it, take Jesus out, out of his out of his out of his setting. And so, uh, you know, so I just want to give that corrective because it's not they're not uh, uh, people treat them like either you love them or they're way out out in left field, there's no, mm -hmm. no good there. There are some there, but they don't know what to do with it. They're not allowing it, and they're, and, they're, and, and they're distorting it. And in terms of the narrative, the problem with the narrative is not just they turn it on its head and it's transgressive. It's just wrong. It's just historically um, in, incorrect. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. No, 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 I appreciate it. I appreciate it. No, 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 I appreciate it. Thank you. There was no question on the end, so I'm reserving my voice. No, it's <laughs> it was great. It was great. It was highly appreciated. Okay, I'm going to take the prerogative as the respondent for, I think, one last question since nobody else is getting up. Well, the question I had for you, and this is also going to tie into one of Brian's questions that I think got glossed over, which is, um, what do you think the implications are for prosperity gospel and televangelism now, particularly in an age where media has expanded and where might someone like Oprah Winfrey fit into, you know, what is this new sort of prosperity gospel? Yeah. A small question oh, to end the, oh, the day with. Oprah seems <laughs> relatively retired um, from television, relatively so. She's not owning it, right? She's owning it. She's, she's not trying to be yeah. on it, right? Um, I, I, I guess I, what, how, how, has, how has what uh, the, the two televangelists that you have looked at, how has their work um, what has happened to that as, as we've moved further along in, right. in, in history? How has that played into what's going on now? Yes, that's a good question. Um, well, so there are so many varieties of televangelists. I'd hate to, to say <laughs> what one particular strand is, but I would say um, the most popular, <laughs> <coughs> most popular African-American televangelists have clearly been T.D. Jakes and Juanita Bynum. Um, but I would say outside of the U.S., you can see black televangelists um, in Africa, in mm -hmm. Europe, and I think those are some of the kind of exciting places for thinking about for the scholarship mm -hmm. because many of them have relationships with T.D. Jakes, and T.D. Jakes goes mm -hmm. to preach there, and they draw large audiences. When Paula White, I mean, um, when Juanita Bynum was in Kenya, she had throngs of people. Um, out for her her um, presentation. At the same time, 
you know, when I ground my work in Jamaica, people are excited about Jake's. They, you know, have historically been excited about what Eda Bynum. At the same time, they maintain a constant critique of American televangelism. They see it as um, overwhelmingly emphasis, emphasis um, having, having an overwhelming emphasis on prosperity mm -hmm. um, to the detriment of the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. And so one local um, television station owner that I interviewed, who the media describes as the one who's gonna be the next, he owns the next TBN, he says what he wants to do is create a media outlet for black Caribbean preachers to be on air without having to have the same demands <laughs> for paid time programming, right? So to the extent that he can give away right. airtime or people right. can, can, can simply pay an offering type to maintain, because he owns the, right. the station outright, right. it was given to him. He wants to create a genre um, a space for a genre in the Caribbean where the prosperity gospel is not necessarily the dominant theology, at least as it relates to how it's seen coming from America, right? They see American preachers as after money. They believe that people should have a, health, a good life, but they don't think it should be so clearly wedded um, to profit in the way that they see it coming from, from the U.S. Um, so I think there are exciting things going on around the world. Um, some of them even, you know, more troubling, but I think even in places like Ghana and Nigeria, there are pastors who are prosperity preachers who often also articulate kind of black nationalist sensibilities, which you really wouldn't see here in the U.S., right? Because they're trying to appeal to a broader black, white, Asian market that they don't have to appeal to in kind of post-colonial West Africa and talking to black West Africans, right? right? So it's, it's, they're, they're different dynamics that are, I think, taking place globally. Okay. I think while you still have a voice, we will wrap. Thank you, Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs>